Hello guys, welcome back to Case Closure and the start of a new playlist, the most masterful of film. The films I will review in this playlist are true gems from the past and hopefully the future but looking at the current trends, um, maybe not. These are films that have catapulted our imagination, changed our thinking and inspired our way of life. And sadly, what we have forgotten in the over-commercialization of stories is that stories once had the power to change our worldview and inspire us. There was a time when a story was only written when it had a higher purpose of sharing ideals, changing misconceptions, propaganda, hey that's always been a story element. But most importantly stories have been written because of the pure love of imagination. And those are the films that I will feature most in this playlist, the most imaginative. Therefore what better place to start than the amazing story that is How's Moving Castle. First, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. And also, because I know this will become a thing, there will be a drinking game with every one of these videos. For this particular one, take a sip every time I say the word imagination, magic, romance, and film. Or if you're not into alcohol, have your M&Ms or a delicious chocolate bar candy and take one or five M&Ms every time I say these words. So let's dive in. Holes of Moving Castle is a Studio Chibli film released in 2004, which if you know anything about this film studio, you know we're in for a treat. And also, I can't really play much of it, so we may have to use our imagination. It was written and directed by Hayao Miyazaki. And for the true lovers of the art of film, the name Hayao Miyazaki, even with me butchering the pronunciation like crazy, should be enough to tell you of the caliber of filmmaking and storytelling present here. And I think I've been lucky because I've been able to participate uh, in the last time, the last era, when we can make films with paper, pencil, and film. He is a brilliantly confusing man with the most imaginative way of telling a simple yet powerful story. He co-founded Studio Chibli in 1985 and went on to direct most of its biggest and unsurprisingly most imaginative films. A breath of this works include Spirited Away, one of the most loved and cherished, Princess Momonoke, Kiki's Delivery Service, My Neighbor Totoro, which I must say is one of my guilty pleasures. During December, right around Christmas, I like to watch my favorite films and Totoro always, always makes the list. So much so that I watch this film even when I'm down and need a pick me up. And if you are vast in all these films I've mentioned or even just one of them, it's truly well a masterpiece in imagination. Miyazaki in 2013, the year he partially retired, said of House Moving Castle that he wanted to convey the message that life is worth living and that that message never changed. So it is a real shame that he partially retired and the world of imagination seems to be tapped for now. Therefore, to understand what he means by the line, it is important to know that the film is based loosely on a book by Dan Wayne Jones of the same name. But while the book focused more on the social classes and genders according to most online sources since I'm yet to read the book, the film took a very unique turn, focused more on love in the midst of a senseless war. The film has won numerous awards and recognition throughout the years, but most important respect given to it is that people who see it don't want it forgotten. Every year it seems there's someone new singing the praise of this highly imaginative and empowering film. Lately, however, I have been feeling like it will eventually be forgotten, like many great films of the past that far exceed newer films in creativity. But instead, just like Spirited Away, it should be a cultural milestone. Or maybe I'm overpraising the film, but I don't think so. It really is that good because it takes you to a whole new world and lets you live in it. The funny thing therefore about the film is that it splits the audience right down the middle. There are those who walk out thinking, wow, best thing I've ever seen, and there are those who just don't get it. Miyazaki himself confessed to this reaction as well as his own confusion about the source material being a bit too hard to distinguish. So he made a film that explained nothing of the magic and only focused on the people. And that is where I think it flourishes. The magic and the modernity together help create a rather unique setting. But I must admit, on first viewing, I was among those who thought, wow, great film and passed it by as simply one among many. On my second viewing, I grew to appreciate the message much more and understood what he means by life is worth living. So fair warning, this is a much more emotional film than it is anything else really. 
House Moving Castle is set in an area somewhat similar to the Victorian age of Old English, not to mention that our main protagonist works religiously in a luxurious hat shop, giving more flame to the British influence in this modern imagination. With the buildings and the countryside and the sudden rise in modernity also sharing the same message, there are steam engines blaring up and down the streets, filling the sky with smoke, the ships and planes are designed with the most vintage eye. The film's overall architecture therefore is very very unique and you could watch 500 more films and never come across another quite like this. And yet it's not quite like our world, it's an alternative universe where magic has persisted in the midst of this fledging modern world. So much so that there is a council of magicians who work with the royal families across the world. There is a head of magicians, Miss Sullivan, who works to keep all of them in check. A kingdom can no longer afford to turn a blind eye to these disreputable witches and wizards. Numerous citizens are seen buying potions and treating magic like a part of their own existence. And in my opinion, this is the one story that perfectly blends magic and modernity. The question of any fantasy world is very difficult, especially when there isn't balance. Most people who write magic or science fiction worlds always downplay the connection and usually the two worlds are never perfectly fit into one and are completely separate to the point that it looks like they don't even affect each other. Take Harry Potter for instance, where magic is hidden on point of death. Ron, I should tell you, most muggles aren't accustomed to seeing a flying car. Uh, right. But in how the magic is so integrated that they are literally one world. Magicians and ordinary people living side by side without any care in the world. The movie wastes no time therefore in introducing the mystery of this magical world. From the midst of mist, the first thing we see is this. The first scene literally transporting us and changing our expectations. Later the juxtaposition of a very ordinary ship farmer and as the two greet each other, this simple sequence says a lot about the world we've wandered into. And as the title card comes on accompanied by a wonderful soundtrack which has been a cornerstone in Studio Chibli films, we realize hopefully that it is more a story of perspectives and themes rather than world reality. Two people having two different world views and still thoroughly content in their own. As a viewer also, what I mean is from my own perspective, the planes in the distance seem to resemble paper airplanes more than real aircrafts, giving me the sense of a childlike wonder of magic mixed with realism before we slowly sink down into reality. Therefore, to fully understand this story, at heart, it is really about the character's perspective and the viewers as well, of not wanting to let go of the childlike fantasies to the over-pollution that is reality and instead desiring madly that the two worlds should exist together which well, we're yet to find out if they can or can't. It makes sense therefore how we meet Sophie, fully considering that whenever an art designer or director draws a scene they're telling us a story, particularly the works of Miyazaki and Studio Chibli. Every scene, every frame is an entirely new story and therefore we meet Sophie, our main character, with her view hidden, smoked out by the pollution of, in the aim of being dramatic, reality. She is presented as someone who cannot see the magic at all. Sophie is a hard worker at her father's hard shop and almost all the major conversations she has had at the beginning are about how bound she is to the shop. We just closed the shop. You've done enough work. Why don't you come out with us this time? Now Sophie, do you really want to spend the rest of your life in that hat shop? Even as the girls run to see House Castle pass by, she watches but barely pays attention to it. And Sophie's first scene ends in pretty much the same way it started. Have you hidden because this is her reality. Work, work, work and loyalty to the shop. A shop that belonged to her father who must have loved it dearly. No, I better finish this. You go and have fun. The shop was just so important to father. And I'm the eldest, I don't mind. We learn mere seconds later that it's more than just work but also her looks that have kept her away from the magic. There's talks of holes stealing girls' hearts, but only the pretty girls. Therefore, the theme of beauty is really explored well in this film. With Sophie's sister being portrayed as so, so beautiful, all the men around her act like they're just about to sing a sonnet. And Sophie, on the other hand, almost completely ignored. 
This is a cliche of modern storytelling, of course, one sister being beautiful and the other ugly, but I think it's more than just the topic of beauty, but more of ego. One sister is treated one way and develops confidently and the other is not. The exploration of beauty in this film therefore looks at it more from the point of self-worth than anything else and it is so well done, I love it. Because gone are the days when films tackle self-worth in such a manner by having an ugly protagonist who is unremarkable in the world around her. And no, not the twilights who don't see their own self-worth and yet everyone does or the tall girls who are just, well, dumb. But really a protagonist you wouldn't admire for any reason. And here, Sophie considers herself unappealing and therefore is certain she will never be fit for the world of magic or experience any of it in any way. She is so certain of her unappealing qualities that she tells her sister how could never come for her because she is not pretty. He was trying to steal your heart. No, he wouldn't. How only does that to beautiful girls? The film goes further to set Sophie apart in her thinking by how lively the world is around her. In fact, there's so much going on. There's a parade, marching tongues, flags, people shouting and dancing and as an audience we really don't know why all of this is happening because Sophie doesn't really care about it. And we are momentarily held by the perspective of our protagonist, therefore everything else is only seen in the distance. It's like New Year's a couple of years ago when I was so very sick and the sounds of fireworks bombarding the night sky didn't even get me out of bed. Sophie is so held in her perspective of the world that even the liveliness of it doesn't rouse her. Hey, looks like a little mouse lost its way. A little mouse has lost its way. Why did the little mouse lose its way? Well, the little mouse didn't want to be seen and ended up losing its way. Sorry. But yeah, sequence of events in most of these films is pretty much unexpected and expected at the same time. What I mean is while most movies will bring two characters together suddenly and you're like, that's too obvious, most of these Chibli films set up a cause and reason to a chance meeting. In this case, Sophie wanders and gets followed by soldiers, panics, and you can only imagine who would come to her rescue. Well, none other than Howl himself, the mysterious magician who eats the hearts of pretty girls. And you're sitting there thinking how expected and yet unexpected a meeting. I was looking everywhere for you. Hey, hey, we're busy here. There's something else the film does brilliantly and it is a subtle exploration of certain themes. In this case, the effects of war on the common folk. The presence of the soldiers is pretty much presented to us as something dangerous to young girls, which looking through history and wartime actually is a dangerous. I'll talk more about these subtle themes later, but the film doesn't hide its realistic portrayal of the period of war. Your mustache scares all the girls. So, I think she's even cuter when she's scared. We finally meet How. The two of you were just leaving. Where to? As an audience, there are two new things we currently know about him aside from the girls and the hats. One, he is willing to save a young, unremarkable lady, and two, he's being followed. And something about these two things just seems so funny to me. Therefore, it says he's the sort of person who can take time out of being followed to rescue someone. Completely changing our initial perspective of him from a cruel, monstrous being to an actual caring person. And as the creatures following Howl become more agitated, a scene that many love comes on. And start walking. There are so many iconic scenes in movies that can't be forgotten. And at par with the castle walking, this scene of them flying is very iconic to me. Magic being exposed to Sophie in its fullest form. The kind of magic that is above all the modernity of the world. Even the people down below so engrossed in their own activities barely look up to notice them. He leaves Sophie with so much mysticism, unexpectedness, that I'm kind of lost for words so I'll just say for my drinking buddy's imagination. Sophie meets with her younger and only sister and based on the scene with the paper it's obvious that she had to look for her sister's working place meaning that these meetings are rather rare and it says so much more about her character and after that Sophie returns back but then probably the most fascinating part of the movie and that's saying something there's another meeting with the witch of the west the person who's been chasing Hull and Sophie is cast from probably 25 to 95 years of age My regards to how. For my story, this is a rather interesting turn. I remember watching the first time and thinking if she considered herself ugly before, what is she going to do with herself now? How is the romance going to blossom? But almost like it's nothing, like it hasn't changed anything about her personality. She experiences an initial shock. No. Oh, no. and returns back to her normal manner and even seems more animated as an old lady than she ever was as a young girl. Ageism has always been a big issue in our society. People who are young seen as worthy and people who have age seen as worthless. I don't know where that came from really but the world of beauty and glamour dictates that when you're younger you're more desirable than when you're older which shouldn't necessarily be the case. 
In this movie, both age and beauty are thrown right out the window and we see a person being more self-accepting than in any other film with a leading female protagonist. You're still in pretty good shape and your clothes finally suit you. In Another Lens, Holes Moving Castle is probably one of the most empowering films out there for women. Being old is worse than I thought. Another thing I love about the film is how certain scenes play out completely silent and others are filled with the music. When Sophie reacts to her new age, it's completely silent except for her movements and words. But later on, as she goes to find magicians, it's filled with wonderful music. Even though Hole doesn't have the best soundtrack in Chibli, it's still memorable. And with this uplifting music, most of what is happening in the world is fed to the audience through side characters like this man talking about a missing prince because still Sophie doesn't care. It is here that we meet a tiny headed scarecrow person. Who is so grateful when Sophie rescues it from the bush that it helps find House Castle. Inside, she meets Calcifer, talking, flame, and we find out that the two have curses on them and therefore they make a deal to help each other. In these two meetings, therefore, nothing is as it seems. All these three characters are cast in different ways. Sophie with age, tiny pet with humiliation and an inhuman appearance, and Calcifer being bound to one place at the mercy of the next person who happens to toss a piece of firewood on the fireplace. You have some kind of spell on you and I've had more than enough of witches and spells. If you can find a way to break the spell that's on me, then I'll break the spell that's on you. You got it? So the very next day, Sophie becomes more accustomed with the castle, meeting Howe's young apprentice. What do you think you're doing here, Grandma? Calcifer said that I could come in. I did not! She meets with Howe, who seems incredibly accommodating. And you are who? Uh, you, you can just call me Grandma Sophie. I'm your new cleaning lady. You who swallowed a falling star, O oh heartless man. Your heart shall soon belong to me. It can't be good for the table. His vanity is also presented in how he tackles things like the cars from the witch, the overall untidiness of the castle. One wonders why he even took on an apprentice. You're not working for the witch of the waste, are you? The magical aspect of this home isn't lost on Sophie either, as she is fascinated with the door that can take you to so many different places. She's impressed by the fireplace that moves the castle. I am thoroughly impressed. You're a first class fire demon. I like your spark. And the more the wonder of it all hits her, her form takes subtle hints as she becomes younger and younger, at least not bent over like before, but more energetic, more confident, more self-assured. Magic in this case, if we're simply looking at perspective, which may have a different one, to me the magic represents anything in your life that appears to you as extraordinary, something that kills the monotony, or gives new meaning to your day-to-day, -day, a romance, a talent, an inspiration, a building, a city, traveling, a book, or even simply things like encouragement, hope, fantasy, our own mindset, or also the simple exhilaration of finishing your chores, which might be a Japanese thing. <laughs> also, a great view can be magic, and its effects are seen in things like the fire glowing brighter because Sophie likes its spark, the apprentice being more lively because there's someone new to help them out, and Sophie being much more animated. Once again, it's all about perspective, and of course, the simple story is that of a lonely, slightly depressed girl meeting an enigmatic, equally lonely wizard. But the deeper message, the thing about life being worth living, are the other perspectives or ideas we take that makes the story special. And now, far from the city, the film presents the countryside as this beautiful paradise, a place of magic. Therefore, as individuals taking a break from the monotony to find magic in our lives is well worth the effort. Even if we are so unfit for the journey as an old lady. This movie is packed with so many amazing themes, most important of which is pacifism or anti-war ideas. Perspective suddenly shifts to Hall, our second protagonist, and we see him transformed into some beast fighting in the war against other wizards. Howl has two separate identities as Jenkins and Pendragon aside from how. Good day. Would this be the residence of the great wizard Pendragon? It is. Both are summoned by the monarch to help fight in the war, but Howl chooses not to respond to either of these, but instead fight, it seems, against both sides. 
It is also pointed out that the wizards who choose to fight in the war give up their humanity in the process. Hal's own actions might take away his humanity as well. In later scenes, we see a battleship come to port and soldiers trying to survive, and the spread of enemy propaganda. A little further on in the movie, when Hal is disguised as the king, he says, Using magic to win the war is not a good idea, as they could be shielding the castle from bombs, but the same bombs only end up falling on civilians instead. Much later, Sophie and Howl watch battleships invade a peaceful setting. What is that thing doing out here? It not only disturbs the characters but even the audience. Watching it, we are meant to see just how destructive the war can be. Howl's political views are brought forward and to Howl it doesn't matter. Theirs or the enemies, the damage is the same. As a character, he takes a hard stance against war, a war that it seems takes away his freedom or more so the magic. Therefore, only Sophie remains undecided of the war at first. But the movie itself is very much pushing the theme of passivism. A lot of Studio Chibli movies share this theme, from the likes of Princess Mononoke to Nausicaa of the Valley. And even to some extent spirited away, they carry the idea of fostering peace, creating balance, avoiding war at all costs for the sake of the little people, for the sake of the wild things, for the sake of our own humanity. And in all honesty, I am in awe of these movies because of such messages. It is a rare type of storytelling that's very separate from the big blockbusters of today where everything comes down to war. And we as an audience love it. In fact, I'll do a review on the biggest blockbusters single repeated thing. So to come back to a film like this one that talks about losing one's humanity in war is rather refreshing. When Hal comes back, the war has affected him in a very frightening way, but he doesn't seem phased by it, seeing it as a consequence he is willing to take on. You shouldn't keep flying around like that. Soon you won't be able to turn back into a human. It is during the scene that we see Hal's vision of Sophie. But at the same time, Hal is the most vain human being there has ever been. When his beauty potions get ruined in the bathroom, he becomes so melodramatic that he gets very close to death. I see no point in living if I can't be beautiful. To Sophie, beauty has never been an option in her life and we are shown that that makes her much more stronger. When Hal comes down a little, bedridden and at the point of death, we get a scene that gives us most of Hal's emotions through dialogue and all the mysteries we have of him finally get answered. Why is the Witch of the Waste chasing him? She was once quite beautiful, so I decided to pursue her. Then I realized she wasn't. So as usual, I ran away. Why is he so depressed, lonely, dramatic and flamboyant all at once? And all of this magic is just to keep everybody away. I can't stand how scared I am. Because in a strange twist, the most magical human being we've been introduced to is scared and hiding, avoiding his responsibilities as much as possible, including the very important oath to report to the castle whenever summoned. This is a theme of magic as escapism. It also has the idea of pulling back the curtain to discover the fascinating person you admired was far less than you thought. The beautiful voice hidden in the theater belongs to a deformed man. The powerful genie is a prisoner. And in this case, the fantastical magician is hiding behind his magic. As for Hull, his fears are represented to us in the next scenes. He sends Sophie in his stead to plead with Sullivan that he's just too useless to use in war. And this leads to one of the funniest scenes in movie history, and I'll fight you on that. At the steps of the royal palace, Sophie, pretending to be Hull's mother, meets with the Witch of the Waste, and the two simply have to climb up a set of steps. It is the simplicity of the scene that cracks me up, as well as the characterization. I don't get it. Where does she get all that energy? If you really think about it, it is so bizarre and clever. So the witch has always wanted an invitation into the palace. For 50 years now to be invited here, ever since that Solomon banished me to live in the wastes. But turns out all such invitations have been traps used by Sullivan to strip wizards and witches of their powers. Sophie's presence therefore gave Hal the courage to fight back, something he wouldn't have been able to do before. In fact, because of her, as Sullivan points out, he was able to even stand before her. Hal reports to me and vows to use his magic to serve the kingdom. I will show him how to break from his demon. But in the process, just like the Witch of the Waste, the true heart of Howl is revealed, and Sullivan believes he is using his powers for selfish reasons. But Sophie, now in love, says that Howl has good intentions. Howl would never be so heartless, selfish and cowardly. He just wants to be free. Some people might think that this is unearned praise, but it really isn't if you consider how these two met. The theme of inner beauty and outer beauty is also represented here. Both Howl and the Witch are focused on outer beauty, while within they are vain, scared and untrustworthy. 
And Sophie, who has no particular outer beauty, within is instead loyal, loving, and kind, kind enough at least to encourage the witch into fulfilling her dream. And while Sullivan strips the wizards and witches of their powers because of this, she completely ignores the capacity for inner beauty. After a dashing escape, and I think dashing is one of my favorite ones, we get another series of scenes that shows us all the themes finally coming together. Sophie's perception of herself is tied to her honesty and her love, and when she's finally honest with herself and her feelings, she seems to easily break her curse, but when she hides her true emotions for fear of not being loved back, her curse takes over her again. He can fix his problem with his demon on his own. I'm certain of it. Now I understand. You're in love with Howl. <gasps> As for Howl, he expresses his love for Sophie in a different way. So, we've got a lot of work to do. We're moving. But he's a much more symbolic move than most people realize at the first viewing. He moves this unlikely family into the city, and not just any city, Sophie's little town, right by the train stop. Howl also made a little room for Sophie, just like the one we see her in the beginning. Why do you do this? So we'd have a room that suited you. At face value, it can simply be seen as kind gestures by Howl, but in a deeper, truer sense, it has so many thematic messages. Howl is willing to let go of the magic for the modernity. Instead of living only in the world of magic, they embrace the city. Instead of roaming aimlessly in the wilderness, they become grounded in an unmovable building. No more moving castles. This, therefore, is Howl shading away his fears and trying to embrace the world that Sophie comes from. However, they've not fully embraced this loss of magic because Howl shows a secret portal just for Sophie. A secret garden where magic is used to make the flowers grow. Did you use your magic to make this? Only a little, just to help the flowers grow. I'm having wonderful flashbacks to Lemire's and one of the saddest songs in the collection. This is the field Howl grew up in when he was alone, and he's giving a part of his history to Sophie. At the heart, the romance aspect of Howl is more about second chances, and even the magic gets a second chance. So far, we've seen the magic as vain and destructive, but suddenly it's presented as peaceful and romantic. But one of the reasons that Howl is willing to let go of his freedom is because he believes he's come to the end of his life. I'm just setting things up so that all of you can live a comfortable life, Sophie. So you are going away. And one of the reasons also that Sophie is willing to help Howl and isn't afraid that he's a monster is because sometimes when you're old... Well, the nice thing about being old is you've got nothing much to lose. The film continues speaking heavily on the subject of war and yet in the midst of this is a simple love story and magic. The war touches our main protagonist. Far from how she started the film, not completely in tune with the world, now it's forced upon her city. On top of this is Sullivan still hunting for Hall. But most important is the change in our characters. Unlike what they thought just moments earlier, they do have something to lose, mostly each other, and that finally pushes them into fully embracing themselves. Help! I'm sorry, Sophie. I should have gotten here sooner. You're alive! In order to save Hal's life, they abandon the city and go back to the castle, thinking if Hal sees they're not in the city, he'll stop fighting the bombs. Thanks, Calcifer. Imagine what I could have done with your eyes or your heart. That's it. You got Hal's heart. The Witch of the Waste, however, is still trapped, and when she sees that Calcifer has Hal's heart, she steals it. That's such a tongue twister. <laughs> This completely derails the structure, separating Sophie from the rest and putting Howl's life in danger. And then, almost like we've teleported into a completely new story, the magic, the imagination comes back to us in a rather interesting way. This is probably the part that most people scratch their heads wondering, what the hell did just happen? Well, the ring Howl gave Sophie led Sophie back in time, and we finally get to see how Howl and Calcifer became linked, and how Howl lost his heart. Wow, such a tongue twister. From my interpretation, because we're not told much about the shooting stars other than through other characters, Howl gave his heart to the shooting star and asked why not much is explained verbally, only visually. When the stars fall to the ground, they die and vanish. Therefore, we are left with the assumption that Howl, watching the stars vanish, was so upset he decided to save one of them. And therefore, to keep it alive, he traded his heart for the star. Another way of looking at it could be that Howl, according to Sullivan, was tricked into giving away his heart, probably out of vanity in order to gain more powers. Either way, the two become linked, and now Sophie knows exactly what she needs to do to set them both free. I know how to help you now! Find me in the future! Outside, she finds Howl completely lost, and the two head back to Calcifer. 
The witch, still clinging to the heart, manages to give it away out of kindness for Sophie. For Sophie is able to put back Hal's heart and Calcifer turns back to wealth. To be honest, I don't really know. The reason why Sophie is able to do this is more so love, like the theme of the kiss that woke up Sleeping Beauty. Therefore, Sophie's love was the only way that Hal could ever get his heart back. I feel terrible. Like there's a weight on my chest. A heart's a heavy burden. Tanip Head, if you remember him, is freed by a kiss from his one true love and it turns out he's the missing prince, the whole reason for the war. Now freed from the curse and the war can finally end. And likewise, Halavant, through the dog, finally works to also put an end to the war. Prince says a rather interesting line to end the movie. One thing you can always count on is that hearts change. And therefore, after a couple of years, he'll be back to claim Sophie again. The reason why I love this line is because it is so powerful. It might seem mean. And therefore that there is no happily ever after but what it really means is that anyone is capable of change the selfish witch finally giving up her obsession and letting go of her prized possession Hal and sophie finding love despite where they started as loners in their own unique world and even calcifer coming back you didn't have to come back calcifer i kind of missed you guys and it looks like it's gonna rain now that everything has been resolved Hal's castle turns into a flying castle fully embracing the magic above everything else the movie tells us therefore to fully embrace the magic in our lives and let the modernity or the work or our own fears not sap it out magic is a perspective of so many different things in this case it's love that makes them transported and therefore with a good perspective or view this rather complicated story really is just a simple expression of ordinary life i have to say though that the movie ends abruptly we cut from this scene to a flying castle with no in between no idea if the city was rebuilt or where Sophie's family ended up or even what the prince did. And at first I hated that. I really wanted to see more of this world, like the prolonged endings in Return of the King. But once again, I think it was brilliantly done because the story is simply about the romance. And that's why my friends, I love, love, love this movie. To me, it's really underrated. <laughs> How to end a review with a flying castle therefore other than just saying thank you so so much guys for watching tell me your perspective of the film and keep watching films that inspire you that transport you to whole other worlds and i'll see you next time bye